So like I said, uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, this event is a joint presentation between the ICE, the Institute of Structural Engineers and Engineers Ireland. It's here to promote the publication of the new Syria document C800, Guidance on the Assessment of Masonry Arch Bridges. My name is Philip Gray, and I was the chair of the project steering group for Syria C800. I'm joined here by tonight's speakers, Matthew Gilbert, Peter Sparks, and John Shave. Matthew is a chartered civil engineer and professor of civil engineering at the University of Sheffield. He has carried out research on the behavior of masonry arch bridges over a period of 30 years. His research has been funded by many organizations, including the EPSRC, Network Rail, and the International Union of Railways. Matthew is an author of C800. Peter is an associate director of Bridges and Structures at ACOM. and as a co-author of Syria C788, Structural Health Monitoring in Civil Engineering, which is published in 2020, and co-author of Syria C764, Hidden Defects and Bridges, which was published in 2017. John is a technical director at WSP. He chairs BSI committee B-555-3, that looks after standards on structural assessment and retrofitting of existing structures. He was involved in drafting DMRB CS454, the assessment code for highway structures and highway bridges and structures that superseded BD21 in 2019. Peter and John were both members of the project steering group for C800. So Matthew will shortly give an overview, overview of the new guidance document, which will be followed by a panel discussion with Peter and John. So for those watching online, Please could you use the Q&A function of Zoom to raise any questions you have for the panel rather than using the chat function. And for those present in the room, you will have an opportunity to raise some questions as well. There seems to be a problem with the slide. Okay. So in the way of background to this publication, Syria published C656, Masonry Arch Bridges, Condition Appraisal and Remedial Treatment in 2006. In the 16 years since that was published, further research covering the assessment of Masonry Arch Bridges has been undertaken. Uh, so the need for updated guidance was proposed by the Bridge Owners Forum to the UK Bridges Board, who then sought uh, funding for the new guidance document from the DFT. The outcome of this funding is the document which was published earlier this June uh, and is free to download on the Syria website. This document, uh, guidance document, is designed to bring up to date the sections of C656 that deal with the assessment of masonry arch bridges by building on guidance available in the DMRB and Epic Rail codes, in research papers, and elsewhere. There are many people involved in getting this guidance document together. Uh, so a massive thank you to our authors, Matthew, uh, Graham Cole, Colin Smith, and Clive Melbourne uh, for pulling it together. And also to our project steering group and Syria project team, who you've got to see here in front of you. Uh, their input has been invaluable to getting this uh, document into the, its final state, which I'm confident will be an important reference document for asset owners managers and engineers going forward. I'll now hand you over to Matthew, who will give us the main presentation. Thanks very much, Philip, and thanks everyone for, for joining us uh, this evening for the, uh, the presentation. So first of all, I'm going to start with a bit of background, um, some of which uh, Philip has already raised. Um, so the authors there, uh, myself, Graham, Colin and Clive, uh, and the fact that the, the, uh, the guidance is now available uh, for free download. Um, the only other information there is that it covers both highway and railway bridges, which is important. Uh, what were we wanting to do when we uh, uh, started uh, drafting the document? Well, really uh, bring up to date the existing guidance, uh, taking on board outcomes from recent research, as, as Philip has mentioned. And in particular, we wanted to describe something which we've coined the permissible limit state to allow the potentially damaging effects of service loads to be at least approximately assessed. 
And uh, as Philip has outlined, uh, we wanted to uh, use this uh, to sort of supplement the existing guidance, uh, Syria six, C656. So there's lots of useful information in there. Uh, it's still current, but the assessment parts of it, uh, you can see as, uh, as being uh, hopefully uh, significantly enhanced as a result of this new document. So context, uh, we know that we have lots of masonry arch bridges around, they're long last, long lived structures, but how they work is, is a mystery to some. We, we don't teach masonry arch behavior on most university courses. Fundamentals, although they're relatively straightforward, they're unfamiliar, and it's easy to get bamboozled by, by jargon, the construction details that you, you face, and also a very wide range of, of visible symptoms. Uh, so really, uh, there's a need to see the woodland and trees, and that's, that's one of the, the key drivers for this guidance. And this, this slide really sort of uh, sums up the, uh, the, the, the problem or uh, um, the, the issue, which is that we, we have masonry arch bridges in lots of different shapes and sizes. We have single spans, multi spans, highway bridges, railway bridges, uh, foot bridges, uh, and, and, and so forth. They come um, in uh, wide bridges, skew bridges, um, internal spandrels, uh, backfilled, and so forth. So there's a huge range, a huge plethora of structures that we need to assess. And that, that really gives us uh, um, a, a little bit of a challenge. In the essence, however, um, boiling down to their essence, we have uh, a masonry arch barrel, which, which spans between abutments, and then there's some material used to uh, provide a level road or rail surface. And uh, if you're not familiar with masonry arch bridges, then um, try not to be daunted by it. Um, you know, that they, 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 they carry, carry the, the load in compression from, from, from the road surface or rail surface down to the abutments. Um, and to determine whether or not the, the bridge in question that you're dealing with has uh, the required uh, load count capacity, uh, we currently use uh, a range of calculation methods. Um, historically, uh, the so-called MEXI method uh, has been popular. That was developed in World War II as a very quick and easy way of assessing uh, bridge capacity. Uh, in recent years, the limitations and weaknesses of the, of the MEXI method have become quite, quite abundantly clear. So in the guidance, we're not recommending use of MEXI. Uh, instead, more rational methods, such as uh, sort of mechanism methods, um, are, are more likely to be uh, uh, useful for predicting whether or not uh, um, a, a bridge has uh, sufficient carrying capacity. Uh, and for more sophisticated or more um, specialist usage, we can move up to, for example, level three um, application of, of, of more complex tools, finite discrete elements and so forth. The downside of, of those advanced tools is clearly uh, there's more expertise needed, there's more input parameters, and actually there's no guarantee that they're gonna be um, less conservative. So that's one of the, the issues that, that, that's uh, um, been a, a problem in the field that sometimes we've actually ended up with, with um, um, lower predictions for the higher level tools than the, the low level tools. And that's one of the things that we seek to address in Syria C800. So the, the big issue, the overriding issue, I guess, is that current assessment methods are often not discriminating. So they don't distinguish between a bridge which will happily take an increased loading and a bridge which will not. And one of the, uh, the key reasons for that, and this is something that we've, we, we discuss in the guidance, is that the, um, the current codes, if you're using, for example, a mechanism method of analysis where you get an ultimate limit state um, prediction of capacity, you assume that the serviceability uh, limit state is satisfied if the applied load is some proportion of the ultimate limit state load. And so there's a fixed link between that ultimate limit state load that you calculate and um, the, the, the amount of service load that you, that you deem reasonable 
to cross that bridge. And the problem is that that's over conservative in some cases. So if the serviceability limit state load, the true SLS load and the, the true ULS load are close together, it's over conservative. If on the other hand, those two limit states are far apart, then you end up with under conservatism. And what are the consequences of that? Well, potentially um, you can have a very pessimistic estimate of strengths and you end up with unnecessary strengthening or even replacement. Um, alternatively, uh, you have an optimistic um, prediction of strength and you end up with, uh, with, with um, a prediction that, uh, for example, a bridge can carry uh, heavy loading to an industrial estate that causes damage, which is difficult and expensive to repair. So that's a key issue. And here is um, a slightly artificial example. This is a laboratory um, of a well, two lab bridge tests. Now, the bridge in question, or the bridges in question, were both three meter spans. They both looked outwardly identical. And you can see that the load carrying capacity of bridge one is significantly higher than bridge two. So in other words, the ultimate limit state load for bridge one is, is high. And if you were to uh, say, for example, that the, the serviceability limit state was half the ULS load, then you can see you come down significantly, but you do still have a very large uh, displacement under the action of that serviceability uh, load. So you've got a, a deflection of about six millimeters um, under the predicted service load limit. Now, in reality, if there's a three meter span bridge and you've got um, six millimeters deflection under the action of every single vehicle, you're gonna have opening and closing of joints and you're gonna have an unsustainable situation. That bridge is not gonna uh, last uh, many, many years uh, into the future, which really is a bridge owner you want. On the other hand, if you look at bridge two, so ULS load there, and then there's a serviceability limit state load that's half fat, and there we have a very small deflection of around a millimetre or so. In that case, that deflection is perfectly likely to be um, sustainable for a long period of time. So this linking of the, the ULS to the SLS uh, capacity is, is an issue. And this is a, a slightly artificial laboratory uh, example of this. So that's led us to develop something called the permissible limit state. What is it? It's the, the state beyond which long-term load-induced degradation occurs. So the idea is that you can, you can pass as many vehicles as you want um, at a level below the PLS and you won't have long-term load-induced degradation. And clearly, if we can establish that, that's really handy for bridge management purposes. If we go above that, then um, we can expect to have that long-term deterioration. And uh, it clearly, um, um, if you know that and you, you do not with your eyes open, that's fine, but uh, it's useful to know. In terms of um, criteria that we use, um, to, to govern the permissible limit state, we've basically got uh, two criteria, system level criteria and material level criteria. So system level, we're talking about limiting uh, deflections. And we might wanna do that, for example, um, to limit the deflections that would occur when the arch barrel tries to move into, for example, surrounding backfill material in order to mobilize restraining soil pressures. So we might wanna place a limit on that to avoid that situation. Uh, because if we have large deflection, then we're gonna end up with opening and closing joints and ratcheting and, and basically a gradual decline of that structure. In terms of the material level, um, when we perform uh, an ultimate limit state uh, um, bridge assessment, we typically use peak strengths, material strengths in our calculations. For the PLS, then we would use lower, um, uh, strengths, material strengths, for example, compressive strengths in our calculations to take account of the fact that we can't expect to mobilize peak strengths time and time again ad infinitum. We're going to end up with breakdown fatigue type issues. So those are the criteria that we use in the, the PLS calculations in the guidance. And in terms of the calculations, it's really 
um, well, there's a simple approach described in the guidance, which really uh, involves performing a, a very similar calculation to what we would normally do if we were calculating the ULS, except for now, we don't expect to, to mobilize uh, significant passive pressures. So effectively, we assume that we've got no soil strength. And also, we, we use reduced masonry strength, as you can see in the, um, um, in the slide there. Again, because peak strength can't be assumed to be mobilized time and time again. Um, underpinning this, uh, this guidance is uh, experimental tests that were carried out at the University of Salford. And we've just got uh, um, uh, some images from one of the tests that were carried out um, during that work. And what we're doing, you can see on the image on the right hand side, is uh, basically um, passing a vehicle over the bridge effectively. Um, with in gradually increasing axle loads, initially 50 kilonewtons, then 60 kilonewtons, uh, 66 kilonewtons. The, each of these is, is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of cycles of this vehicle moving across, We're gradually increasing it. And then at this point, when we get to 84 kilonewtons, we start to be able to, to sustain that magnitude. And then we have um, dropping out of, of bricks, um, as you can see on the, uh, um, the images on the left-hand side. And if we try to increase the, the load further, then we end up having um, a situation where the bridge basically can't, can't uh, sustain uh, uh, the, the load at all. Um, if we use those simple calculations that I've just outlined, where we basically assume that soil pressures are not going to be... Um, um, mobilized, then we end up with um, a prediction of 72 kilonewtons, which you can see is a bit lower than the 84 kilonewtons that we actually got in this particular test, but it's a reasonable estimate of what we can expect to get in the, uh, uh, out of this bridge. Um, it, assuming that we are um, applying the load time and time again. In terms of the, the, the same bridge loaded to the ULS, in this particular case, actually it took about 140 kilonewtons. So it was, is actually about a factor of two, which I referred to earlier. However, if we'd filled it with clay soil, for example, we would end up with a, a much lower ultimate limit state of around 90 kilonewtons and a very similar PLS. So it matters what fill material is used in the, uh, in the um, bridge as to how close the ULS and PLS are. Um, what happens if, if we exceed the PLS load? Well, we see this time and time again when we're going out inspecting bridges in the field. Um, the key thing to know is that masonry bridges have a wide range of construction details. And so we expect, uh, can expect a wide range of symptoms. So in the image on the right, we can see a... Uh, a classic case of the, um, of the longitudinal crack in the arch barrel uh, near the edge of the bridge. Uh, what we have is the arch barrel is, is, is trying to move into the, into the fill material and we end up with a stiffness mismatch, we end up with a crack growing uh, and we end up with uh, um, the situation that you can see on screen. But there are many, many different types of construction details and there are many, many different types of symptoms. And so we've got a, you know, just a, a an image from the, um, or a figure from the, the guidance document, which basically just, just spells it out. For any given fundamental underlying cause, there are a range of symptoms. Just like human beings, you know, there's been lots of COVID around, different people have, have had different symptoms as a result of that. So what are the ramifications for assessment then? The key thing is we're proposing that you do two calculations an independent US calculation and an independent PLS calculation. Particularly important before allowing increased axle loads or um, a change in the pattern of loading. If you, so if you want a prediction of what's going to happen, then carrying out both ULS and a PLS is likely to be much more discriminating than our current uh, combined approach. And Actually, um, the, the current um, National Highways uh, guidance, uh, CS454, is already splitting up 
the calculations into a, a, a ULS calculation in, in this clause 7.1, and then effectively a PLS calculation in clause 7.2. At the moment, um, there, there is in clause 7.2 a fixed link between um, the PLS and the ULS, but in the next revision, I will be liaising with um, National Highways, uh, it's going to permit use of the calculations from Syria C800. So, um, on to the, the new guidance. Um, what does it contain? Well, there's quite a lot of information which just really just eases the reader into, into the topic. Um, for example, uh, information on bridge construction behaviour, um, particularly useful for less experienced engineers who uh, haven't had a lot of, uh, of hands-on or, or field experience of, of inspecting and assessing uh, masonry arch bridges. Uh, but hopefully it'll be useful to, to more experienced engineers as well. Um, then moving on, more information on um, from an sort of assessment side, garnering the, 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 the relevant information uh, for assessment. Um, and then a key chapter is chapter seven, which is all about undertaking assessment, and that describes uh, both ULS and PLS calculations um, using the new PLS um, approach that we describe in the, uh, the guidance. And then lastly, uh, chapter eight, uh, looks at observation and monitoring, so that can either be a, a um, an independent approach. So, you know, um, if, if, if calculation method is not deemed appropriate, or as a supplement to uh, the calculations, um, you know, just to, to provide additional information. And then, lastly, we have uh, a range of appendices, basically backing up um, the the main information and also providing some examples, some case study examples, so you can. Uh, uh, work through, uh, for example, the calculations that are described uh, in the context of a real world bridge. So, uh, chapter three, uh, just a quick sort of flavor of the sorts of contents. You know, chapter three covers, for example, diversity of construction details. Um, also, uh, lots of um, sketches that, to try to explain what's going on. Uh, for example, the sketch on the, the top left is basically trying to get across the fact that if you have a, a short span bridge, then foreseeable live load magnitude is going to be quite high in relation to the self weight of the, the structure. So you might end up with a, a classical, like for example, four hinge mechanism. Whereas if you have a much longer span, then foreseeable live loading is going to be uh, pretty small in relation to the self weight. And there are other issues which are going to govern um, the management of that structure. And similarly, uh, in the top right, um, in, a, in a small structure, um, the stresses are generally low, much lower than in a, larger, a, a, a geometrically similar larger structure. So what that means is that um, given that we have the same, for example, mortar materials that are used for small bridges and, and big bridges, the stresses are more likely to exceed the, the strength of the, the mortar in a larger structure than they are in a smaller structure. So hopefully lots of uh, interesting and illuminating points uh, raised in, in those, uh, the, those sketches, but this is a very small selection of them here. Uh, so moving on then to um, chapter seven, assessment calculations. Um, so as stated on the slide, both ULS and PLS calculations are described. ULS calculations are, are, are similar to existing codes, although we're now using a, a variable model factor this is really to try and get over this issue that simple calculations potentially uh, giving uh, optimistic predictions of strength relative to the, the higher level tools. So we're proposing using a model factor. Uh, and then obviously the PLS, which we've described earlier. And then um, the, sort of the background information and, and calculations are, are in the appendices. So example of a, a case study that's, that's in one of the appendices. This is uh, Wiley Hill Bridge. It's a relatively small span bridge, 3.28 meters span. It's actually one of the oldest bridges on the, the rail network because it was built for the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1824. Um, 
it's quite happy there for um, almost a couple of hundred years. And then um, following an increase in freight traffic a few years ago, it started to show quite sudden and uh, sustained uh, deterioration. Um, we ended up actually um, intervening and, 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 and trialling a, a strengthening uh, technique on, on this particular bridge. But in terms of the, um, the case study calculations, uh, what, we've, what we've did is um, use the current network rail code to give us uh, an indication of the, the adequacy of this particular structure. So in the right-hand column, we've got an adequacy factor uh, and basically it means if it's over one, it means that the, um, the, the structure can carry the factored loading successfully. If it's less than one, it means it can't. So in the case of the network rail code, um, it's suggesting that this bridge is fine. If we use the Syria C800 calculations uh, to carry out an, an ultimate limit state uh, analysis, it's actually... Uh, even, even higher, so it's, it's well above one, it's 1.19. But then if we look at the, the PLS calculations for this particular structure, you can see there's an issue. It's quite significantly below one. And that actually is reflected by what we actually saw in the field. This, this structure was not happy under the action of these, um, in this particular case, coal trains uh, that had been uh, um, directed uh, over it uh, for a period of years. Um, so I've already mentioned uh, links with uh, current assessment codes in the case of highway structures. So as I said, as it says here, we've been working with national highways. So the revision two, which is due out very shortly, will explicitly cite Syria C800. Um, and we've We've had representation of network rail on our project steering committee. Uh, I think it's going to take a little bit longer um, for um, changes to uh, occur in, in that case, but, but watch this space. Um, and then nothing to do with the assessment of masonry arches themselves, but assessment of the parapets, which may sit on top of masonry bridges, just to let you know, if you're not aware of it, there is a new British standard that's just been released uh, BS 8779 was uh, released on the last day of May this year. And, and basically it succeeds 6779 part four, which was drawn a few years ago. And it basically uh, includes the containment charts that were originally uh, included in a, a DFT guidance document. So if you're in the business of uh, assessing parapets, then you need to uh, be looking at this. Okay, so uh, just before I, I finish, just, just, just to sort of, uh, I'm, I'm from university and it's, I guess my business is to, is, is, is to sort of uh, um, stress that not everything's solved and certainly there are uh, outstanding issues uh, to solve and there is current research ongoing in this area. Uh, one of the things that we're working on at the moment is, is 3D behaviour, bearing in mind that, that real bridges are three-dimensional in, 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 in nature, we have three-dimensional loading and so forth. And the other thing is to do a bit more work on this issue of multi-level assessment and to, to address the, the issue of, of, of potentially uh, the lower level tools uh, providing optimistic uh, predictions of strength. We've, we've started to make progress on that in Syria C800, but it's, but it's probably more work to do. So just bring your attention to this project, current project, uh, funded by APSSC. It's running for the next... Um, um, over a period of years from 2019 to 2023, uh, various universities involved, my own university, Sheffield, Leeds and Imperial College, and uh, um, 15 uh, industry partners, as you can see there. Um, in terms of what we're doing, we're basically going right back to sort of the fundamentals in the upper level, trying to develop understanding using uh, experiments and finite element modeling. In the middle band there, we're looking to develop uh, more sort of uh, accessible three-dimensional analysis and assessment tools. And then uh, finally, in the bottom there in red, we're looking to clearly develop, develop, div I can't say it, deliver impact in the same way as we've, uh, we've delivered uh, impact on, on a previous project that led to this current Syria guidance. As I said, we've delivered impact. We're hoping to deliver impact. 
via, uh, by you using it uh, successfully to get better predictions of um, bridge strength. So in terms of um, what the, the, the current project is going to deliver, um, so yeah, input into assessment codes, practical software, educational tools and resources. So for example, we've got um, what's going to appear as a web app very shortly, shown on the right there, where you will be able to, to play around with a free web tool to actually explore three-dimensional failure modes. So watch this space. Hopefully there's gonna be some interesting outcomes from this project. And just a, bit, bit, uh, a sort of blatant plug, we're actually recruiting uh, for a couple of researchers on this project at the moment. So we're looking for a postdoctoral researcher and also we've got a fully funded PhD studentship. So if you're interested in, in Mason Ash Bridges and really making a difference, then drop me an email uh, after this, this talk. Okay, so just wrapping up then, conclusions. Um, new guidance has been published. So the, the aim was to bring it up to date existing guidance, uh, feeding in research uh, findings. And a key element of this is the new permissible limit state. And forthcoming revision of CS454 will allow this PLS to be used in the assessment of highway bridges. Uh, and then finally, finally, um, Philip's already shown a, a slide with lots of names of people to thank, but it's actually even more names because there are um, people involved in the, in, in the underlying EPSC project steering group uh, who have contributed to this work as well and many of us. So thanks everybody who's, uh, who's made this possible. It certainly has been a, a, a team effort. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, so before I start the panel discussion, I'd like to invite Peter and John up uh, to the podium uh, to give their overarching views on the new guidance documents. So Peter, if you want to come up first. Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Sparks. Just like to say a few words on the importance of preparatory work for assessment. Assessment is an opportunity to increase and confirm knowledge about capacity for use in assessment for many years. In my view, it's much more than just um, an event solely to calculate a capacity value. This is increasingly the case as bridge owners want to know about what's the reliable value of the asset life of my bridge, particularly with railway bridges. And for this reason, um, prepar the preparatory work for an assessment is, extreme, is an extremely important part. By this, I mean desk study, record review, inspection for assessment, survey, and sometimes even investigation is necessary when you realize from your initial work that you lack enough information to do an adequate assessment. And for this reason, C800 has a very good content on the work uh, that an engineer needs to consider to, to prepare for the calculation stage of an assessment. This is an example, two examples. The one on the left is um, a, a, a laser plot of defects on the side of a bridge using modern techniques, um, crack, crack identification, and using color to identify certain parts of the masonry, um, using techniques that probably wouldn't have been used nearly so much 10 years ago. A second feature on the, is on the right. This is one of a series of pages in C800 where um, a defect is described how it influences behavior. And then on the right-hand side, you see an example of the defect and in, in a photograph form. And generally, C800 has a lot more visuals than previous advice information on assessment provided. And 
Um, this is very important for the quality of assessment. And I, I personally welcome it because I think if you, if you create a much more thorough and detailed um, information base, you end up with a better assessment. Because you're going to, as I said, you're going to use that assessment for, or the owner will use that assessment for several years to come before he comes again to refresh the assessment. And with bridge assessment, we're coming to the point now, as we have done possibly for the past 10 years, where bridges are being reassessed and reassessments are finding out that possibly not enough was done in the original assessment um, and more needs to be done now. And because partly because more can be done because we have new techniques. If you pay enough time and um, attention to what is wrong with a bridge physically, particularly its integrity, then you get a better understanding of how the bridge will works in practice. And you can do carry out an assessment which fits. An assessment, after all, is quite often, in a sense, a model but it must be as close as possible to the actual bridge in question. The, in the top photograph on the right, you've got an example of where the voussoirs are cracking because they're different in stiffness to the brickwork behind. That's a classic case. And it's, it's an example of where you need to see that the, an arch bridge is in fact separate parts. And you need to identify in your assessment what part is weakest and what part you must focus on in your calculations. Right. John. Thank you, Peter. I think as, as Philip said earlier, two of my kind of main professional interests are working on developing standards and also in the, the field of assessment of existing structures. So this document I think kind of squarely aligns with both of those interests and I'm really keen to see it being made available to engineers because uh, documents like this C800 they provide an important role in guiding engineers towards making good decisions and how they approach the assessment of the structures and improving the quality of the advice that they're giving as a result of that assessment to those who are responsible for managing the uh, structural assets. And I think for assessment of masonry arches, it's particularly important as you know, they're a key part of our, our, our heritage infrastructure and they make up a large proportion of the, the bridges that we have in the UK. And uh, I think as, as both uh, Matthew and Peter spoke about earlier, you know, as a structural form, they have an elegant simplicity but their actual behavior in service and the assessment of their low carrying capacity can be pretty challenging and sometimes quite complex. Um, there are also all the ongoing challenges that we have for existing structures, such as the need to consider traffic loads that are of higher magnitudes than were designed for, and the need to consider the impacts of the deterioration of the structure. Um, so meaning that even for structures that have been standing for over 100 years successfully, there can be an ongoing need uh, to assess them and assess their capacity. So the way that this aligns with the standards that we use for assessment is, is interesting. In the UK, we've had uh, standards and guidance for assessment of existing structures for some time now for both highways and, and rail structures. Um, these standards tend to focus on the high level requirements of the client organizations um, and they don't give that much detail on how to carry out the actual structural analysis and so to help us with those decisions we really need guidance documents like the C800 document which will help engineers to produce high quality assessments and particularly in those cases when it's necessary to go beyond the simplest level of analysis in order to show that, that, that the assessment can work. Um, at the moment in the UK and across Europe, there are developments in assessment standards happening. Um, so I'm involved in the development of Eurocodes and some of the next generation of Eurocodes will include content that is about assessment of existing structures, um, which 
including a prospective addition to EN 1990 and to some of the material Eurocodes. So there's a lot of work going on there to look at how we can reduce conservatism, how we can be more accurate uh, in assessing the capacity of structures, taking account of their actual in situ properties, their actual, including deterioration and, and all sorts of different <laughs> things that can affect existing structures. Um, sometimes through more sophisticated sophisticated analyses, uh, sometimes by gathering more data from the in situ structure that we can use to improve the level of confidence that we have in the uh, parameters that we use in the assessment. And uh, this drive towards having more accurate assessments um, highlights the importance of using a range of possible different tools and approaches. And I think that's where C800 really excels by providing a range of different tools and approaches uh, that can be useful uh, and help us to understand the uh, behavior of the structures and to make good decisions on how we can model these structures. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to see C800. I think it's a potential to become a, a key document for all engineers carrying out masonry arch assessments. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and John. If I might ask you to make your way over to the table, we we'll get our panel discussion started in a moment. So yeah, we have about maybe 25 minutes or so, half an hour uh, to kind of go through some questions. Um, so once they're set up and comfortable, uh, I will start asking some questions. So, the first question I have here is, and I'll give this to you first, Matthew, uh, is where did the information come from to create the PLS section? Right. Well, uh, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, a long answer to that. Um, if you refer to the, um, if Philip's able to, uh, when he's back on the podium, able to connect up his, um, his laptop to the, the guidance in appendix um, page 90, I think. Let's have a look. There's actually quite a lot of background information on where the where the, uh, the PLS came from. So yeah, page so 88, 89, 90. Um, so the underpinning research project funded by EPSSC allowed us to do some tests on uh, a number of bridges where we were able to cyclically lure those bridges to failure. Uh, however, it was a relatively small number of bridges, so we also made use of um, bridges that have been tested monotonically to collapse, and we were looking for, for example, a break in the curve in the load deflection uh, curve to uh, to indicate when the uh, for example, the surrounding soil pressure started to need to, for example, yes, this is uh, exactly the right uh, um, slide of it. I can't, it's not showing up very well on, from where I'm sitting, uh, the, um, the, the PLS part of it, sort of grey band across the middle of the screen there. Um, so we, we, we carried out some cyclic loading tests, cyclic loading tests, and we also um, looked at literature to try and find as much information as we could to indicate uh, how those bridges are working and how uh, potentially we could identify the point at which a bridge, uh, above which the bridge could, could no longer be safely loaded without uh, experiencing long-term um, load-induced deterioration. Um, but anyone who's interested, um, feel free to download it from the Syria website and have a look at uh, Appendix A8. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I don't know if John or Peter have much to do with the PLS information, but is there anything you'd like to add or will I move on to the next question? No, yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question I have here is, and Peter, maybe I'll address, you can address this one first, is what do you think are the biggest takeaways from C800? I think the 
one of the biggest takeaways is that um, the the um, the guide reveals how much information must be considered in assessment. Perhaps it 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 serves a better it serves that purpose better than previous um, the previous advice note did for the highways bridge assessment BD twenty one. Um, simply because it more is much more is known now about the influence of the integrity of masonry and bridges and there's more and more attention to um, the way masonry behaves in an arch that we must consider in assessment it's there used to be possibly too much emphasis on carrying out a calculation using certain methods quick um, look and getting out a quantity and, and some bridge owners were keen to use methods like mexi for that reason but um an assessment and i'm saying i'm biased because i've done a, a few assess, bridge assessments and looked at a few bridges and they have a lot more sort of idiosyncratic character shall we say than a lot of concrete bridges you have to understand the particular features and of the integrity and the related behavior of a masonry arch bridge and that's become that's been realized more and more particularly with railway bridges where the dynamic effects of the trains now clearly have effects that are coming to roost unfortunately with the length of time that they've lived and we have to be more thorough with assessments and c800 i think collectively the information brings out the importance of that task of that aim it, it, you know it, it fits with what must be done now with bridge assessment masonry arch bridges that to me is what comes across and i think that enables um a better quality of assessment to be carried out, particularly with reassessment of bridges. We should improve if we can, and, and, and C800 will help that to be achieved. Thank you very much. Uh, John or Matthew, if you want, you want to add to that? No. Okay, All right, we can move on to the next question. And since you have the microphone in your hand, John, uh, I'll direct this one to you. So, how does this document fit into an engineer's suite of standards and guidance documents when assessing masonry arch bridges? Okay, um, so yeah, I think standards and guidance documents, I guess they kind of, they go together in some ways. You have the standards, which give you the framework for how to satisfy the requirements of the particular uh, client organization in terms of what needs to be shown but they don't always give you a lot of understanding of uh, how to model the structure for instance um, but it, they'll set out things like the loads the partial factors the uh, the ways of taking account of condition uh, and different perhaps different options in terms of how you might carry out analysis but without much kind of guidance involved and I think that's why as I mentioned earlier this is really useful because it gives an understanding of how these structures behave and how that understanding can then translate into the decisions you make in the assessment, whether that's about how you do the, the choice of analysis methods or how you take account of the different defects and the different condition um, issues that the bridge might have. Um, so I think there's one part of it in terms of just providing that context providing that understanding and kind of educational kind of side to it which really kind of fits quite well with uh, applying the standards in a really in the best way um and then i guess the other thing that kind of links in with the standards is this new method that that matt has described um called the permissible limit state which is perhaps a a uh, a new advance in terms of how we can look at that particular issue in most new arches and uh, and i think at the moment if you're doing a, a highway bridge and you're using cs454 for instance then um 
you know, there's a method that is kind of broadly analogous, but much, much simpler, um, but not as, as Matthew showed, it's not always uh, very accurate. And so there's a, there's a, an opportunity to perhaps go a bit further than the traditional methods that have been used in the past. Now, at the moment, I think that would require a departure from standard uh, if you were, I mean, it would depend on the technical approval authority that, that was uh, applicable and the processes they had. But I think the, uh, the direction of travel is that hopefully there shouldn't in the future need to be a departure from standard. And if there's a, a way of um, looking at new methods such as this, um, for example, through the uh, AIP document and, and uh, different kind of options, then it does mean that potentially we've got more options available to us in terms of how we can demonstrate that structures are actually okay in terms of their, their capacity. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of questions coming through here on the Q&A function. Uh, I'll go through some of those first and then open it up to the room as well after that. Uh, so the first question I've got here is, can you give uh, some more information about why MEXI should not form part of an, any modern bridge management process and how that, that, that could affect bridge owners whose low current obligations are defined by old standards? Uh, so can you give more information about why MEXI should not form part of any modern bridge management, management process and how that could affect bridge owners whose low carrying obligations are defined by the old standards. Okay, I, I thought you mentioned low carbon. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> a different what, matter. What, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, what, what, what you will notice if you're using um, the, the, the highway uh, code is you'll see that the, the range of applicability of MEX has been gradually been reducing. So before you couldn't use it for the longer spans and now you can't use it for the shorter spans. Is it, there's, a, there's a part in the middle where um, uh, it can be used still, according to CS454. Um, and, the, and, and, the, and the reason the, um, the change was made in, the, in relation to the, the shorter spans is that so some, some issues with the underlying equations were found, which meant that it, it, it basically um, didn't, um, didn't work successfully, didn't give reasonable re uh, results for, for, for shorter spans. Um, however, it, more generally, it's um, it, it's a black box. It, it can't be changed. Many of the, um, the, the the factors that are applied to the result that you get are, are are very general. And these days, we can use tools which allow the particular defects, for example, to be modeled directly. So it doesn't seem to make sense to, 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 to use um, uh, tools which, which that is, isn't, isn't possible. Um, I think in, in, if you step, step back, it's basically, in my opinion, an observational method. So you get an, a number out of it, and um, if the bridge looks happy, you have a condition factor, um, for a condition factor that's this close to one. If it looks very unhappy, you give it a low condition factor and you migrate towards the correct result. Um, and so in that sense, it kind of it kind of works, but it's a very, very costly tool to use if you want a predictive tool that's going to tell you whether or not uh, a particular stretch of road with a number of masonry bridges on it can successfully take uh, heavy goods vehicles going to a new, new industrial estate or whatever. It doesn't have a predictive capability. Uh, and that's a kind of a key thing. And it's a key thing we're trying to get inject into this, this new guidance is through the use of the PLS is enhance the predictive capability of assessments. And that isn't, it isn't obvious how that can be done with Mexi. So that's a very, uh, sorry, long answer, but hopefully yeah. uh, um, helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I suppose John and Peter from the consultancy world, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'll add a little bit to that. I think the question said, can we explain why Maxi should form no part of a yeah. strategy, which I think is probably a bit too strong, because I think um, when you look at the, uh, the approaches that are normally taken in assessment, you know, the, in the standards, they talked about 
different levels of assessment. And we have some very simple tools. You have the network rail has the level zero assessment. We have the level one assessments. And then you progress through to higher levels of assessment if you need to, in order to demonstrate the, uh, the result. So I think there definitely is a place for quick and simple tools um, if they give you the answer that you need, um, but only if they're, um, they can be justified technically. And I think some of the issues with Maxi have been to just put some, some conditions on, on when it can be used and when it, when it shouldn't be used. But within the constraints of, um, of, of its uh, applicability, then I think, yeah, it's, it is permitted by, by DMRB. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying it should form no part of, it, of a strategy. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. Just, 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 just. So in, in the um, guidance, it says it's not a recommended method of assessment in this guide. It doesn't say it's a prohibited method or it, 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 it cannot be used, but it's given other the availability of other um, better methods. And I have, to, I have to be careful here because um, uh, of a conflict of interest, because I am, I am involved in um, a university spin-out company, which, which does um, sell commercially um, a software tool um, called Limit State Ring. Uh, and so yeah, um, you know, that, that does compromise my, 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 my answer to some extent. However, what I can say is that I haven't benefited personally from that spin-up company um, since its, its founding in 2006. So that, that company is really a, a vehicle to get research out there in the hands of engineers rather than as a means of me, um, me profiting. But I, I do appreciate it does, it does, does slightly uh, um, compromise my uh, objectivity on this as far as some of you are concerned. But to, to me, this is 2022, Mexi was devised in World War II as a quick way of determining whether tanks could, could cross over bridges or not. Um, the approach doesn't really uh, stand up to scrutiny in my, in my opinion, but there are different, different views in, in different members of the, uh, um, the authors of, 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 the, of the guide and also different members of the uh, project steering group. Thank you very much. Um, just within the room here, is there anybody who would like to raise a question? If not, I might, whilst you're thinking about that, I might go to another one from Zoom. Um, so there's one here. Is there a significant difference in the time required to carry out an assessment under the new guidance? Um, well, there'll be two, two independent calculations. So um, there is a little bit more work required, um, however, the inputs for both calculations are mostly the same. Does it, does it, does it, there's very little, I'm trying to think of what more information is needed. It, the information is used in, in a slightly different way in the PLS compared with the ULS. So we, we factor the compressive strength and we, 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 we don't apply the same soil pressure. So it's a really a negligible, um, uh, um, um, amount of, of a difference in work um, and um, certainly um, you know, if software is being used um, there's no reason why um, the, 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 the two results couldn't be couldn't be output you know almost at the same time and hence it would, would not increase the effort at all okay thank you very much um, I think here is one for uh, for you all actually so are the panelists happy that the PLS accurately reflects the behavior of skew arches? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, um, I'm not confident that any of our current methods of assessment um, provide good predictions of the capacity of skew bridges. So ULS and PLS. Uh, if we're talking about significantly skewed structures, we get, have different behaviour from skew bridges. And at the moment, we're in a kind of two-dimensional world where uh, we're willing the behaviour to be two-dimensional when, particularly in the case of skew bridges, that isn't the case. So 
Um, yeah, that, this, is, this is sales pitch for, for the research, the ongoing research project that I'm currently involved in, where we're looking at, at just that. So hopefully in the next few years, we will, uh, we will make available tools which, which will provide much better um, assessment capability for, for SKU bridges. Thank you. Um, I will continue with the Zoom questions here. Um, so there's a question here. Does C800 consider recent or ongoing research on the dynamic behavior of arches and use appropriateness of the long-standing use of a 1.8 impact factor on a single axle? Very specific. So what we've tried to do is, is feed in um, research uh, into, into the guidance. Uh, I remember being involved in the International Union of Railways project that was basically, um, I'm trying to think of how many, it's about, about 15 railway companies, from mostly from around Europe, but also uh, some worldwide. And they were canvassed on how they dealt with dynamic effects. And every single railway company had a different model for dynamic effects. And so that's telling me that, that people had no, no idea really how to, to include dynamic effects in um, the case of Mr. Match Bridges. However, UIC did actually commission some work by uh, a colleague at University College Dublin who, who looked at dynamic effects in the context of Mr. Match Bridges and, and found that, uh, that really, um, the, the the methods that were used by many railway companies were inappropriate. Many of many of them were actually idealizing a masonry arch as a, as a beam, and and effectively applying the same kind of methodology to masonry arches, and finding actually that the masonry arch bridges are not subject to the same uh, dynamic excitation as, as beam spans. In terms of the the one point eight, uh, this appears to to largely uh, stem from. Um, uh, road surface and, and actually you know bumpiness of the, of the road as opposed to uh dynamic excitation of the, of the structure which is slightly different from some of those uh, uic um dynamic factors and the other thing that's 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 interesting is i think the uk is the only country that applies the dynamic factors to one axle whereas everybody else applies the dynamic factors to every axle so it's you know it's an area ripe for, for more research, is, is my um, kind of um, final answer on that. Final answer. Uh, John? Oh, yeah, the other thing I would say, quite apart from the behavior, the dynamic behavior of the arch itself, is that the 1.8 factor in CS454 now, there's an option to, to use 1.62 if you've got good surface quality. So, you know, there's, and there are other, factors that have changed on the loading side related to the load model which do mean that if you're comparing it with an older version of bd21 for instance you might get a, a better result if you take account of those those effects in in the latest version thank you very much john i'd like to add one point that um c800 has brought more into focus in bringing in more detail. Um, the pattern of masonry plays a big part in how arch bridges behave. And I think in the past assessments ignored this, I suppose because it wasn't requested to be considered in standards. C800 is a, a good document for one reason, simple reason, it's not a standard, it's a guide. It's free. It's not tied to any particular standard. It can be used for highway bridges and railway bridges. And it, it invites the assessor, the assessment engineer, to think about a lot more. And it's definitely important to consider um, the, ma the masonry pattern of your particular bridge and relate that to the defects, have a look at the defects, the cracking pattern, understand how the structure works, because what you're seeing in an inspection is telling you about the history of the bridge, how it's behaved from, a, you can make some assumption about the start when it was in good condition, you can see what condition it's in now. And that is telling you something about the real behavior 
of your bridge. All assessment, yes, it must use analysis, but it must still keep its keep a connection with your particular bridge. And so this this is very important to 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 consider in in an assessment. Uh, going back to the point about Mexi, Mexi makes top far too broad um, sort of definitions about condition. Condition is quite a particular thing. There are different types of condition for different parts of the bridge. After all, masonry is a mixture of of different elements with quite different stiffnesses. The arch is far more flexible, for instance, than the piers. And the spandrel walls and the parapets are like big stiff beams, hence the connection of those with the arch invariably can cause a lot of cracks, particularly if you have stone voussoirs on the outside and far smaller brickwork on the inside. And we're seeing that more and more with bridges. This type of detail shows how important it is to think of all these aspects, not just look at one or two in assessment. And, if C800 is doing a good thing, it's making, I hope it's make will make people realize there is much more to consider and it's important to consider it. And owners need to see this, particularly owners of, I would say, stone bridges and owners of brick bridges where ring separation might be a problem. You have to understand the limitations of the integrity of the bridge because the masonry bridge has limitations. It's not tied together with reinforcement. You have to understand that and put that qualitative assessment, which is partly what an inspection is, link that with your quantitative assessment. Thank you. Actually, you might hold on to the microphone because you mentioned something there which you might be able to answer. Um, do you for you mentioned spandrel separation and gaps and cracks? Do you consider differential stiffness the only reason for this issue? Sorry, Philip. Say again. Apologies. Um, in reference to spandrel separation, gaps and cracks, do you consider differential stiffness the only reason for this issue? It must play a part in it. Yes, it, it, the, the spandrel wall is very different from the arch. The spandrel wall is like a stiff beam. It, I mean, when you look at an arch bridge, if you think if the, the spandrel walls are not connected to the arch in terms of masonry connections, but they are the deep walls. Therefore, you've created a U-frame bridge in a sense, crudely. So since the, since the spandrel walls sit on the arch, there must be separation at the interface. And Bill Harvey pointed this out recently in a paper on viaducts. Um, so, so have I answered your, your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Any other commentary from the panel on that one? Not on that one specifically, but just, just the um, just defects um, in, in general. I think I, I, I tried to make the point in my slides about this, but I've just, just got something from a statement directly from the guide. So it says symptoms versus root cause. For defects induced by live loads, increasing the load above a certain level is likely to lead to le less reliable secondary elements of a bridge being mobilized, which leads to progressive formation of cracks or other defects when loading is applied frequently. And then this level of load is termed a PLS load. Now, now you could say the spandrel wall could be considered as one of those less reliable secondary elements um, so if you think about the, you know, the, 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 a core masonry arch bridge, um, shouldn't need to deform significantly in order to mobilize these, the, the, these additional elements of the, uh, of resistance. Um, if it does, then it can only do so a finite number of times. So that's, a, that's one way of sort of visualizing the, the PLS. And it's also one way of, of trying to, uh, make sense of, of what we see, because there is a danger that because there's a, what, such a wide variety of different bridges out there, and when you go to two bridges, you'll see different manifestations of, you know, an underlying cause. And, you, and, you, and you, you can, if you don't rationalize it, don't, don't think about it clearly, you can think, oh, you know, this, is, this is terribly complicated. Um, if you think about it as just being a single underlying cause, which is not enough live load resistance, basically, um, and you expect then to see the, the, the symptoms being very, very varied, then it, it, it makes it easier to, um, um, to kind of uh, feel confident that you, you know, you're, um, 
um, you, you're not you, you're not swimming against the tide. You're actually actually uh, you've got some understanding, and 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 uh, it's not impossibly complicated because I think there is a danger that that you, Mason Arch Bridge is shrouded in this sort of mysterious air where you know you need to spend a million years um, understanding everything before you can be uh, in a position to assess a single bridge. I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, there's there's some fundamentals, you know, there. Um, and you can expect these this very wide range of symptoms. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting question here. Um, in order to undertake the PLS analysis, are there any additional inspections or laboratory testing required? Um, in the case of the, the simple uh, approach that we're, we're, we're proposing in this, this guidance, then, then no. If you want to do an observational uh, method, then potentially you can, you can identify whether the PLS is exceeded using observations, but you would, you would potentially need um, you know, quite sophisticated monitoring and other equipment, long-term monitoring equipment to do that. But using the simple calculation-based method that we're proposing, the answer is no. Okay, does uh, anybody else in the room have any questions? Yes. Just wondering if there's anything said about water and drainage, and particularly uh, the assessor on the site is seeing the efflorescence and staining, and what effect that will make for the analysis that's being carried out. So, in case people, um, Joining virtually couldn't hear that. The question was about water and whether guidance uh, refers to water and, for example, uh, efflorescence um, staining as a result of water. So, um, I mean, the guidance is on assessment, so um, it's not giving instructions about how to fix faulty drainage. So, what it would be doing is, for example, uh, indicating that staining could be used to give you a good indication about what the internal makeup of the bridge is and so for example indicating how much backing there might be or the presence of internal voids and so forth so there is some um steer in that respect um in the guidance yes Does anybody else yes, peter yeah. yes I'd, I'd say that it's very important to uh, I'm dealing with a bridge at the moment where understanding how the seepage of water into the structure and out, understanding how that affects its integrity is very important because it's clearly having some effect on its capacity. Um, now, C800 doesn't go into that sort of detail, but, it, but as I've said before, it makes the emphasis of the importance of a very rigorous inspection because invariably an arch bridge is not nearly as uniform as we might assume in assessment. It's convenient that a danger in assessment and particularly in assessment calculations is convenience. Mexi is used possibly because it's convenient. It gives a quick result and, and it doesn't take long. That, that's not the right reason to do an assessment. An assessment should be to provide you with good information for what you need to know that you can use in the future reliably. Um, water, in my view, clearly affects the stiffness of mortar in bridges, particularly in stone bridges, where the, the mortar joints are invariably thinner and softer, because they're probably a lime, than a, than a, a brick mortar where the joints are thicker and the modular unit brick, brick is much smaller than a stone. Therefore, the, the mortar is doing a much better job of forming a matrix. The effect of water on the, on the, on the stone bridge can be to weaken parts of it. And that comes back to a point that I think that arch bridges invariably have a varying stiffness that we, again, we don't consider in assessment and possibly we should in some cases. If we're going to improve assessment, we must take into account that we're getting, we're getting, we're trying to be more accurate. Therefore, we need more information. Therefore, we're considering more the variability because the variability 
of stiffness in masonry arches definitely affects how it works. The, the edges of an arch bridge are often stiffer because of the spandrel walls above them than the central part of an arch. The, an arch can be an underbridge carrying railways with what predominant traffic in one direction on one track and predominant the traffic in the opposite direction on the other track can cause a shearing effect. But invariably that occurs where it further away from the stiffening effect of the spandrel walls. You're back to the point that you, it pays to understand the stiffness. I'm not advocating highly complex analysis. And I think um, Matthew's Amarby um, project has an, an important and worthwhile intention to create better forms of analysis and the, that are not overly complex, but improve on what we have now. Um, some way, so, shall we say, some of them will hopefully be halfway between the more simpler forms that we commonly use at the moment and, the, and, the, and more complex finite element models. And we'll improve how we get results and understand actual bridges. But in doing so, as I said, we must, we, we have the responsibility, I think, to pick up on the fact that arch bridges have variations that in their material properties, which are affected by, in their decay, by water. And in the future, particularly if, if owners want to know more about the asset life of their bridges, we will need to consider that kind of information more than we have in the past. And I think C800 encourages us to do that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time here now. It's uh, almost 10 to, eight, 10 to 8. So I might just, there, we have lots of questions here. There's no way we're going to get through them all. Uh, so I might just take another two questions. But before I look at the Zoom ones, as, anything else from the room? Yeah, we have one down the back here. Yeah, um, just a question about, not the Experience so, Peter, because you've been involved in, in lots of guidance documents, is not just this one. If you could maybe repeat the question. For, could, could, could you say the question again? Do you mind? interested in the process of coming up with new guidance. Um, for example, I mean, today we're talking about the focus on assessment and history and much. But in, in your research, you know, in the approach or um, in the process of doing research that came up, you know, that, that um, uh, we came up with this new guidance. Are there something that so, for example, if I look at assessment of other bridges, obviously, that's a great part. Are there things that uh, we can learn from your experience? Yes, I think it's, 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 it's sort of the journey from research to, to guidance, and maybe, maybe I'm best off um, answering it. So, so the question is, is, is about that, is about lessons learned. Uh, have we any uh, good wisdom to convey about the process of, of moving from research into uh, in, into guidance and potentially for other other types of, of bridges and I guess other types of, of um, infrastructure I guess um, I mean in this particular case it it, it wasn't a model approach um, in, in a, co a colleague who was going to be taking the lead on the on on the project um, ended up um, for personal reasons wasn't able to um, to do it and also at the time it was an EPSC project but we hadn't budgeted for for example the expenses of Syria to help us with um, the report um, writing so we we then had to uh, sort of delay after the, the, the completion of the research to to work with for example the Bridge Owners Forum the Bridges Board uh, organizations that, that Phyllis mentioned so lessons from if you if you're doing research is is try to build in um, the resources to deliver impact, even if you don't necessarily know 
uh, what the impact will be and and exactly what how it will manifest itself. So you can have a best guess and then effectively you uh, you hopefully will be in a better place. Now the Amabi project that which as we mentioned earlier, we did actually budget for um, Syria expenses. So hopefully if we find interesting things out, we, we will be able to um, um, start the process but have some funding without quite the, um, the bureaucracy of, of going through the formal channels to seek external funding. In this case, it was funded by the Department for Transport. So basically, British Board uh, supported by the Department for Transport. Does that help a bit? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's it's nearly five to uh, eight now, so maybe just take this as the last one. So apologies for everybody who I can't get to, um, but a question on uh, mortars. So could the healing ability of time uh, of lime mortars in old structures increase the PLS of structures subject to infrequent heavy traffic? Bit of an interesting one to finish off with. Is it talking about autogenous healing, um, which is, um, yeah, it's actually a, one of the things that we've said that we, we're looking at in our current MRB project. So, so um, I mean, if you, if you, if you, anybody who's, who's inspected bridges um, to any great extent will, will see how, you know, there, there's a structure that's perfectly happy in its current situation, carrying vehicles which are probably far heavier than 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 than, than were intended um but the shape of the, of, of the arch is entirely different to that that uh, originally built and that can be due to um movement of the abutments or it can in some cases be due to actually live load effects have actually um, um changed it from not very efficient shape into a more efficient shape um and and what's happened is exactly that. Well, it's not just lime mortar, it's also, you know, fines from film material have actually worked their way into the joints in some cases. And effectively it's found, it's articulated to a new equilibrium. And in some cases is in, in rude health. Not, not, not always, it depends, depends on, on, on scenario and, and exactly, uh, you know, how, it, how, it, how it's, uh, what hand it's been dealt with in terms of its environmental conditions and all the rest of it. But yeah, it's a very good, very good question. So I think there are, there are um, opportunities to learn more about, uh, about that process. And, um, and I guess more, more, more just for final point, more, more generally, um, there's a realization with, with the, the carbon crisis that perhaps we're going to be, be building less concrete structures and perhaps more um, masonry structures. Um, but we don't want to build them with um, with strong mortar because uh, if if we have strong mortar, we can't actually remove that and recycle the blocks or the bricks. So if we if we use go back to the the weaker mortar, we can effectively reuse these 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 stone blocks or clay bricks. You know, potentially almost an infinite number of times, which is it's pretty uh, um, important given the uh, the, the importance of uh, uh, material efficiency that, that yeah. we've currently got. Uh, so, John and Peter, any parting words on this? Um, no, I'd just like to thank you for being part of the panel, for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a really important document. So. Yes, I'd like to echo what John's just said. Um, the new highways, the, I call it the new, it's quite young, the new highway standard is important because it's in any new standard it usually improves on the old but it lacks in my opinion the advice note of old and serial 800 plays an important part in providing that not just for highway bridges but for railway bridges as well it, it has that an important freedom in that respect and i'd say it's a more powerful document than say the advice notes that um, the highway structures would use to have. So it's, it's, it's got a lot of potential um, for, for use in future, but, and obviously uses, it's already valuable as for a, a method for the PLS that, you know, can be used as, I would, I suggest, 
as a departure from standards until the, in what's, until the PLS method is absorbed into a revision of CS454. And hopefully the, 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 railway, the railway standards are revised or revised and taking note what C800 uh, says on this matter. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna draw this event to a close. Um, so again, I'd just like to thank our speakers, Matthew, John and Peter for their input tonight. Uh, I found it very enjoyable and very informing. And again, thank you to everybody who's joined us online and also in person here tonight. It's actually great to see people back in a room again. It's, it's been a long time. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll be seeing lots more events like this in the future. But um, again, uh, you probably saw a message there from Maureen that this event is being recorded. And the plan is that both ICE, ISTRUCT and Engineers Ireland will all be hosting a recording of this on their, on their websites. Uh, again, all attendees will receive a, a link to uh, the recording as well. So thank you all again and uh, good night. <laughs>